What is up guys, Blue Spooky here. Just wanted to let you know before you start this video that this is a long horror compilation, but it consists entirely of new stories that I've not read before. I'm going to try during the middle of the week, maybe every week or every other week, doing a long video of new stories like this and see how you guys like it. There will also be ads only after the first three stories, but not after any of the stories after. So you can listen to it and go to sleep or listen in the background or whatever you need to do. Without any further ado though, let's get right into the video. So this story happened about 11 years ago. I was a senior in high school at the time, but it is the single most mind-boggling thing I have ever experienced. It's also important to note that it happened in mid-December. I'm from Iowa, and the winters here get cold at night. As in, if you get stuck outside, you will die kind of cold. That plus the snowfall makes everything dead silent. You can hear anything and everything inside the house, and even immediately outside of it as well. Well, me and my best friend were hanging out in my family's walkout basement, just having a boring winter night playing video games. We were also the only ones home. The reason it was just us there is because my mother went from work straight to a bar to grab a few drinks with co-workers, so my friend and I thought it might be a good opportunity to break into the family wine and live it up a little. As we were sitting there opening up the first bottle, I hear the door to the garage open and slam shut. I immediately go, oh shit, and start looking for places to hide the bottle away. My friend then says to me, Hey, I thought your mom was supposed to be out all night. I replied that she was. I then heard a few heavy stomps and heard my mother yell out. Hello? Anyone home? I yell back up the stairs. Uh, yeah, just hanging out in the basement. I hear a few more steps move from the garage door toward the stairs, and she yells out once again. Hey, uh, can you come up and help me with something? I need you up here right now. I replied back while frantically trying to find a good place to hide the wine bottle. Yeah, yeah, just give me a minute. There was silence for about 20 seconds. Is, uh, anyone down there with you? She yelled back in a more serious, concerned tone, in a voice that was slightly off from my mother's. This was the very first thing that told me that something was not right. Our family never cared if anyone was over, as our house was a very open house to all family and friends. And the voice, it was just wrong as well. It sounded nearly identical to my mother's, but it was missing something I just couldn't quite put my finger on. Weirded out, I replied back, It's just Colton! After I yelled that back to her, I found a good place to hide the bottle and began walking up the steps to the next level. Now, as I was walking up them, I couldn't help but feel the overbearing silence that was now in the house, and that slightly electric twinge in the air, telling me that something was not right. When I got to the top of the steps, I looked over to where the door to the garage was, and also the kitchen right next to it. It was black, pitch black as if all the lights were shut off. There wasn't even any moonlight shining in through the windows. I walked over to the kitchen and yelled out, Mom? Mom, where are you? There was no reply, just silence and darkness. I felt that electric twinge turn into full-on needles, and my adrenaline started kicking in full force. I had to get out of there as fast as possible. My mother was obviously not home. I ran back down the stairs, grabbing my coat along the way. What's wrong? Colton says. My mom's not home. I replied as fast as I could, looking for my truck keys. What do you mean? We were just talking with her. I could see the confusion in his face. There's no one home. We need to leave now. I took a few steps back toward the back door that opened up to the yard, and I saw my dog shaking on the couch, my cat growling behind it. I couldn't just leave them there. I just knew that if we left, something bad would happen. Where are we going? Are we leaving? Colton said, still confused as all hell. No, I can't leave them here all alone. Something's really off. I'm gonna call my mom and figure this out. I pulled out my phone and called my mom. She picked up immediately. 
Mom, were you just home? I heard you yelling for me from the second level and when I went up you weren't there. I said frantically, hoping she was playing a joke. No, I'm just leaving the bar. I wasn't feeling very well. Are you okay? What do you mean you heard me? I filled her in on the whole story and she rushed home. Colton and I stayed in the basement with the animals until she got home. Before she did, we could hear something upstairs. Not like walking or sitting on things, but like a weird pressure in the air, like a black hole was slowly moving from one room to the next. The word I would instinctively describe it as is hungry. When she finally got home, it was like all the tension just immediately disappeared just as quick as it came, like an overbearing predatory presence had just flown away. We still haven't figured out what the hell was going on. This is just one story of many unexplainable things that have happened to us, but this is the easiest to write down, and one that I was happy to have a witness for. My mother has since passed away now, and I've moved away to Arizona, but whenever I go back to Iowa and I see Colton, he still gets creeped out by what happened. I never truly knew what it was, but I know that whatever it was that had my mother's voice, it was evil, and it was hungry. This experience happened to me a long time ago when I was very young, around 7 or 8 years old I believe. After poking around this subreddit for a while, I felt like it was an appropriate place to tell my story. So, basically my entire family was throwing a reunion slash New Year's Eve party at this huge hotel. All of the adults decided to go down to the bar to drink thinking that all of us kids had already gone to sleep. Obviously though, we weren't. There was enough candy and soda in our systems to keep us up for 72 hours at least. We decided to use all this energy to run out in the hallway and play a game of hide and seek. Yeah, real smart idea. Anyway, there were six of us children, and we split up into two groups of three, each group hiding together so no one would wander off and get us all into trouble. When it was my group's turn to hide, we somehow all managed to get lost at different corners of the hotel, and being the child that I was, the thought of being lost was already frightening enough to me. After circling the floor of our room around five times, I decided it would be logical to just go down to the bar where my parents were. Huh. Big mistake. I walked to the elevator, and when the doors opened, I noticed there was already a man waiting inside there. I didn't think very much of it. It was a big hotel, and it was no surprise that someone else had to take the elevator to the main floor as well. The man asked if I needed to go down to the first floor too, and I said yes. The man was very tall and reeked of beer. He had on a dirty trench coat and sunglasses as well. I tried to maintain as little eye contact with him as possible, until he asked me a rather odd question. Hey, you're looking for your friends, right? I stood there speechless, wondering how he even knew what I was doing before. You're the one who was playing hide and seek, aren't you? I mumbled a scared, uh, yeah? Finding it weird that he seemed to have been watching us play this game the whole time. We both remained quiet until the doors opened to the third floor, not the main one. I just thought the man had hit the wrong button or something, so I reached over to hit the first floor. He reached for my arm and began trying to drag me out of the elevator. I immediately froze up and he whispered to me, Come on, I know where your friends are, gesturing to the dead end of the hallway where all the vending machines were located. He walked closer to me, grabbing my arm and again attempting to drag me to this isolated section of the hall. I managed to twist away and bolted to the stairs, practically screeching the entire time. I managed to reach the main floor, only to run into my entire family, including the people I had been playing hide-and-seek with, who had been looking for me the entire time I was with the man. Needless to say, I still get a little bit wary when I'm alone with a stranger in an elevator.
This is not supernaturally creepy, but it is one of the more disturbing and surreal experiences of my life. One early morning, a few short years ago, I'm walking to my bus stop minding my own business and eating a banana. It was dark and misty, around 5 a.m., and I was internally debating something trivial, like if I want my daily Starbucks before or after the commute. As I approached the dimly lit corner on my street, a tall man in a black mask steps out of the dark alleyway to my left. Sleepy and disoriented, I barely even acknowledge him. When he shouts, Put down your fucking purse! and points his gun to my head, things start to click. The man says, Put down your bags! I tell him, okay, okay, I'm putting them down over here. He orders me to walk over to him, toward the alley. Get down on the fucking ground. I agree. I'm coming, I'm coming, okay, okay. My heart is beating a million miles a minute, and my hands still smell sticky with banana residue. I knew I needed to get away. I don't know why, but my mouth just would not stop working. Look, see, I'm on the ground, my stuff is over there. Please, just take my stuff. He apparently did not like that very much. Just shut the fuck up, okay? He gets on top of me and puts the gun to my head. At this point, I should mention the fact that I'm on my way to coach a high school practice, and I was dressed up like a dude. Huge baggy pants, hat, jacket, if not for my telltale voice. I'd look like a prepubescent 90s rap star. Anyway, as the guy gets on top of me, gun to my head, he looks at me and pauses. I can't tell you why I know this, but I swear in that moment, it clicked for him that I was a woman. He gets off me and stands up, and points over to the dark alley. Come with me. My stomach hurt. I remembered there had been a recent rash of sexual assaults in my neighborhood. During the daytime, no less. When the man pointed down that dirty alleyway, my internal voice spoke the fuck up. It said, Number one, there is no way in hell you are going down there without a fight. But he has a gun, you dipshit. Replies my internal voice too. And number two, Fucking follow me! The real voice, his voice hollers. So I do what I do best. I talk. I'm coming, I'm following you! I call. The man makes a crucial mistake in this moment. He believes me. I take one, two tiny steps backward toward the sidewalk. He turns his body and his gun toward the alley. This is my moment. I take a deep breath, tuck my head down in case he starts shooting, and start sprinting away. I hear a voice screaming in a high-pitched wail before I realize that it's mine. After running six or seven blocks, I head back to my apartment hoping he's not there to see where I lived. The police check out the alleyway an hour later, but the potential attacker was long gone. The only evidence of the entire encounter was my banana peel, browning in the alleyway, and the adrenaline rush that I couldn't seem to shake for days on end. I would be lying if I said that the experience doesn't bother me still, but I'm so fortunate to mainly be haunted by what-ifs, and not the what-dids. This happened about 13 years ago, when I was a sophomore in college attending a liberal arts school in Suffolk County, New York. Within the first month or two of freshman year, I had found myself in a very tight-knit group of fellow theater geeks. Six guys, myself included, and one girl. They all loved horror movies and ghost stories. I knew I had found my crew. Freshman year was tough but we all held each other up and made the whole experience more enjoyable for everybody in our group. At the beginning of our sophomore year, we decided that in October, as the Halloween season was ramping up, we would find a creepy wooded spot in a nearby town some night and scare the crap out of ourselves. We did some research and found there was a particularly isolated area about 30 minutes away, infamous for paranormal sightings. Perfect. The seven of us split into two different cars and headed out into the night. Allow me to set the scene. 
you turn off a busy main road, flooded with strip malls and restaurants and whatnot, and you are almost immediately greeted by complete darkness. Again, this area was very heavily wooded. It was essentially a large web of winding roads, surrounded completely by trees. Very few street lights, even fewer houses. Without a GPS or a good sense of direction, one could easily get lost in there. We all made sure to have fully charged phones and flashlights, just in case, but the goal was to keep driving until we collectively decided to pull over and go exploring. As per the directions, we made a left off the main road, driving for 30 or so minutes into this dark network, picking directions at random, getting intentionally lost. Our cars made this turn, and to our surprise, there was a huge log right in front of us. It seemed we had reached a dead end of some kind with nothing but trees beyond this. We all got out to see what exactly this was. We stepped over the log and noticed two narrow trails leading in opposite directions. Well now, this seemed like as good a time as any to grab our flashlights and do us some amateur ghost hunting. We flipped a coin and set off on the trail to the right. The trail was so narrow, we had to walk single file to avoid getting whacked by branches. For whatever reason, I ended up being the one in the back. I'm usually pretty rational and level-headed, but I have to say, the further and further we went in, the more I was overcome with this uneasy feeling. I kept hearing these sounds deep in the woods, unable to shake the feeling we were being watched. I seemed to be the only one hearing these things though, so I shrugged it off as my imagination. And in any case, the whole point of us being there was to get scared anyway. Not to mention the fact that we were seven able-bodied college students. What would we possibly come across that could take us all down? We headed down this trail for another 20 minutes, and just when I thought it would never end, we came to a massive clearing. And I mean massive. It was a large open field of unkempt grass, comparable in scope to a golf course, of course not nearly as well manicured. Trees surrounded the entire field, which was so large we couldn't even see the end of it from where we were standing. I was thrilled to get out of that narrow trail, but I don't think any of us were expecting to find an area so vast. One of us looked off to the right and said, Hey, come check this out. We all turned. There was this old, dilapidated house, several hundred yards away. The house was completely dark, no cars or signs of anyone actually living there. We walked over and shined our flashlights at it. Sure enough, the windows and doors were all completely boarded up. I managed to peer in between the boards on one of the windows, and what I could see was an old white couch covered in plastic, but otherwise an empty room. Whoever had used to live here, they were now long gone. Because there was no way in, and because we all felt sufficiently creeped out by the house anyway, we decided to walk closer to the trail we had come in from, have a seat in the field, and figure out what to do next. We walked toward the narrow trail, but before we could sit down, my friend Mark suddenly stopped what he was doing. His expression fell immediately, and he pointed to the distance. We all turned, and on the very far side of the field directly across from where we had come in, we could see someone, tall and lanky, dancing between the trees. And by dancing, I mean skipping around, grabbing a tree, swinging from two to fro, then doing the same to another, basically a do -si do The moon was so bright and the woods so dark, it took us a second for us to really understand just what we were looking at. Jay, the six foot four skeptic of the group, wasn't seeing anything though. I leaned into him and pointed in that direction. Jay, look where I'm pointing, don't you see that? He squinted a bit and the second he saw it, he gasped with everything he had, clutched my arm and whispered, What the fuck is that? What happened next sent shockwaves through all of us. Whoever this was, they stopped dancing, looked in our direction, and started charging straight at us. Without even thinking, we freaked and ran back to the trail. Yet again, Jay was the only one who hadn't seen this happening, though. He shouted after us. 
Guys, what's happening? Where are we going? After about 15 seconds of running like hell, I heard Jay scream. Holy shit! I looked back and saw his flashlight following the rest of us into the trail. While the walk into the woods took about 20 minutes, we made it back to our two cars, hopped in, and were peeling away in closer to five. Once we were a safe distance away, we pulled over, got out, and checked in with each other about what just happened. My heart was pounding. I knew everyone else was feeling the same way. Nearly 15 years later, we're all still friends, living in different states, yet keeping in touch through marriages, divorces, children, etc. But occasionally, out of the blue, one of us will send a group text to the others with something to the effect of, in the woods back then. That really happened, right? It most certainly did. The experience is always in the back of my mind, and I'm pretty sure it always will be. Here's the thing that still resonates with me about that night, though. Whoever that was, they were dancing maniacally in the woods at one in the morning, and then they ran directly for a group of young adults, not at all phased by the fact they were severely outnumbered. Had this person known we were there from the very second we parked? Was he the source of the sounds I kept hearing as we walked on the trail? Whatever the case may be, when he came for us that night, you can be sure none of us wanted to stick around and see what a person like that was truly capable of. My first year of college was a real challenge for me. I'm extremely introverted, and while I do have friends I spend time with, I do not make new friends very easily. I'm simply too shy to approach others, and I'm no good at connecting with strangers either. It's just kind of who I am, and I'm okay with that. When we started classes that fall, I was the invisible girl. Never called attention to myself if I could help it. You know the type, I'm sure. There are a lot of people who specialize in invisibility. So, I didn't have a lot of friends that semester. Just people I would call acquaintances. We all got along fine, but... They couldn't really be called friends. Now at this time, I was battling my own demons too. When I was 16, I was brutally raped and by no means was I over it. It was a major factor in my life. I went to therapy regularly and was treated for major depression, extreme anxiety disorder, and PTSD. I was walking a thin line, trying to pull myself together and get on with life while at the same time feeling very isolated and therefore vulnerable around others. I avoided men whenever I could simply because I wasn't ready to let my guard down yet, and it was exhausting being on constant high alert. I was also rather paranoid. It's impossible to avoid potentially dangerous, to my paranoid mind, situations when living on campus and being the loner I was. There were times when I simply had to walk back to my dorm in the dark, or participate in a group project with men, etc. I worked hard on my self-confidence, though, and while I did eventually overcome my fears, at that time I was always on edge. I'm sure you can understand. One day I went to class in the Humanities Building. Not a big deal, but the classroom was on the top floor of a tall building, and I usually rode the elevator. That elevator was slow as fuck, but still better than walking up 12 flights of stairs. With me? I get to the building, call the elevator, and wait. To my surprise, when the doors opened, I was the only one who got in. That was a relief because of my paranoia. Then it happened. The doors were closing, when someone stuck a hand in the middle, and four guys got in. This wasn't good. My anxiety hit the roof and I backed myself into a corner, so I felt somewhat safer. I kept telling myself it was perfectly fine. These men were ordinary guys. They weren't going to hurt me. I should try and relax. Then one of those bastards turned to me, grinned the most malicious grin, and said, There's only one girl here. Let's get her. All shit broke out. I'm sure it must have been a joke or something albeit a very disgusting one, but at the time I didn't take it that way at all. What he said when he made that comment, 
It made me panic. I had my book bag full to bursting with heavy books on the ground in front of me. In complete terror, I picked it up and started wildly swinging. When the doors finally opened, there were four very surprised men either on the ground or huddling away from me, while I stood in the middle hyperventilating and still swinging away. I've never seen anyone exit an elevator that fast, and I'm not talking about me. Those guys actually stumbled over each other, trying to get away from me. It took me a long time to calm down, but in the end it was a huge step in rebuilding my confidence. I'd been in a potentially dangerous position with those four men in that elevator, and I defended myself quite effectively. That was the beginning of reclaiming myself, and to the dudes who intentionally threatened rape. Perhaps next time you pull that misogynistic shit, we'll meet again, and when we do, I'll be ready once more. So, my uncle used to work a lot when I was younger. He's done a lot of different things to make money, but one consistent thing is that in the summer months and into late fall, he would paint houses. It was a legitimate business and everything. He's got a truck with a number, a name, and supplies in the back. The whole works. Every now and then he would call my dad when he needed a little extra help, and I'd go work for him. No big deal really, it's just painting houses. What could possibly go wrong? Well, turns out it takes a little while to paint a whole house. If the weather conditions aren't right, then you can't paint. One particular fall was extremely wet. It rained what felt like every single day. My uncle would paint multiple houses at a time. So sometimes he would get caught up due to situations like these, and I'd work a little more than usual. That was fine by me, though. The job wasn't hard, and it paid very well as well. Anyway, it was a warm day for late fall, but there was a distinct chill in the air. One that kind of penetrated through you and stung at your very soul. My uncle had this job he had to finish. It was an old Victorian house in a quiet part of town. A lady and her husband, who was an author, lived there. Due to the weather, it had taken longer than expected to paint the house and there were family issues going on at the time, which further complicated things. My uncle gets a call one day from the lady who lives at the house. She says that her husband is trying to write his next book, but he keeps getting distracted by the scaffolding outside the house. She wanted to know if we could come over and finish the job as soon as possible. My uncle was always an honest businessman. They contracted him to do the job in midsummer, but he had lots of jobs that summer and the wet conditions I mentioned above made it difficult to finish anything. However, these people were insistent but very polite, and not wanting to lose customers or get a bad recommendation, my uncle decided to put this house as a high priority. After all, it should take at most a day or two to finish. So, we show up to this house mid-afternoon. Like I said, it was a weird kinda chilly day. I also remember it being eerily calm. The day was slightly overcast, so everything was shrouded in grey. It was like the perfect setting for a mystery crime novel. We arrive at this house and my uncle and I move to the back. The front of the house was already done, so there was nothing left to do there. My uncle, being the more experienced painter, would always do the touch-ups, and I would simply apply the first coats, since they took very little skill. Anyway, we get to the back of the house, and he asks me if I'm scared of heights. I was 17 at the time, and although they did scare me a little, I didn't want to seem like a child in front of my uncle, so I told him I wasn't. He was very happy to hear that. He had me climb up the scaffold to the third floor to finish an upper section of the house. There was a small window up there, a tiny little oval one that looked right into the attic. The attic also happened to be the husband's study. He would do most of his writing in there. So... I'm climbing up this scaffolding, cans of paint dangling behind me, and various paint brushes and other tools in the utility belt my uncle let me borrow. I get to the top of the scaffolding, set all my supplies down, I crack open a can of paint, and start painting like I had a few hundred times before. Outside of the temperature, the overcast, and the eerie calm, this day was just like any other. 
I'm working my way across the top part of the house when I get to the window that looks into the study. I bend down to dip my paintbrush in and stand back up to paint above the window. The window was in my direct line of sight and I couldn't help but gaze inside. I see a man, the husband, staring back at me with a face completely devoid of any emotion. I had never seen a face so devoid of feeling before and I still haven't since. Of course, I got startled and took a step back. I chuckled and smiled at the guy, but he didn't smile back. Instead, while remaining completely emotionless, he drew a pistol up to his head that he was holding in his right hand the whole time and proceeded to blow his brains out without ever breaking eye contact right in front of me while I was still staring at him. In utter shock, I gasped and let out the smallest scream as I stepped back in fear. Only, I took too far a step back and fell off the scaffolding. Alerted by the gunshot, my uncle looked up in just enough time to see me falling off the scaffolding from the third story. I was lucky enough to land in a bush and only suffer a broken ankle and a few scratches. The biggest wounds happened in my head. I had to go to counseling for a while. It's been years since then, but I still remember that man's face. I've never forgotten it and it will always be burned into the back of my head. I know now why, looking back, his face was so devoid of emotion. Because he never felt any emotion at all. He literally didn't care about what he was doing. As it turns out, the man was seriously depressed and facing severe marital issues with his wife. Combined with a few too many nights drunk on whiskey and facing severe rider's block, I guess he decided he just couldn't take it anymore. His wife moved out of the house shortly after, and we never did finish that job. To this day, that house remains abandoned, and to this day, I try to never drive down the street it's on. I'm scared that if I do and happen to pass the backyard, I'll see that man staring back at me from that window, so cold and emotionless. I'm a girl and this happened when I was 20 in the early 2000s. People used landlines and cell phones were not unlimited at the time. This happened in a town about an hour away from Sacramento. My friend was house sitting for a family that her family was friends with from church. She was to house sit in the country just out of town for a week. They had animals like cats, rabbits, a donkey and even a horse. The family also had dogs too, but they took the family dogs with them on the trip. My friend was in charge of feeding the animals and watching the place. She didn't have to get the mail daily, because they had this metal lockbox style mailbox down their long driveway. They didn't have any neighbors for miles, just fields of alfalfa, cattle, and corn. So I guess the lockbox was just for safety or something. Towards the end of the week, she asked if I wanted to spend the night and keep her company. I thought it sounded like a lot of fun, actually. I had moved out of my aunt's and uncle's and gotten my own apartment, so I told her I'd pick her up on the way there after I got out of work. We got there at around 9.30pm, grabbing some dinner along the way. We went into the barn first thing and fed the animals. It was a little late for their dinner and they made their hunger well known with their animal noises. We made sure they had lots of food and water and went inside. This house was a big ranch style house. Single story, the living room was to the left as you walked into the home. There was a long hallway directly to the right of the entrance that led to where the bathroom and bedrooms were. Straight ahead was a dining area and to the left of that was the kitchen entrance and a patio door. They did not have an open floor plan. In the kitchen, on the opposite side, was also a long hall that had several doors as well. My friend explained to me that the wife ran a daycare center out of this house. All of these hallway rooms were play areas for the kids she would take care of. We didn't bother going over there because we had zero interest in that sort of thing. We watched some TV instead, ate our leftovers, and talked a bit about people we knew. As it got later, she turned on the house alarm and said she didn't like sleeping in other people's beds, so she had been sleeping on the couch instead. She then offered the bed to me. 
she would sleep on one of the two huge recliners that reclined so far back it was almost flat. The chairs were really comfortable, so I just said I'd take the chair instead. I went and laid back in a chair with my blanket. We turned off the TV and were talking for maybe 20 minutes in the dark, when suddenly the motion sensor floodlights started shining through the window, completely lighting up the room. Now, I really have no idea why people in the country think it's okay to not have curtains or blinds, because to me, that's insane. We both got real quiet, and Amanda says, maybe it was one of the cats. Then though, we start hearing gravel crunch, like a person walking across in the parking area outside. My chair was closest to the window. I slid carefully down to the floor, clutching my stupid blanket for safety the whole time. The floodlight timed out and my friend slid to the floor as well. We laid on our stomachs there in the dark, not knowing what to do for a minute. We heard a loud bang, and all of a sudden the house alarm started blaring. The floodlights turned on again. It was so loud we covered our ears, and I started to panic. I swear I've never been so close to peeing my pants before in my life. I began crawling towards the keypad for security, because I've seen the commercials. There's a button you can push and a person responds to you in case of an emergency, or at least they'll send the police. I look at the main screen. It says patio one of two open. Amanda starts to cry a little and hits the call assistance button on the pad. Nothing happens. There's no assistance. I ask her where the phone is. She says there's one in the kitchen and one in the parents' room down the hall. Our choices are to either go in the kitchen past the windows and next to one of those patio doors, or go down the hall to the parents' room and use the phone there. I asked her where the other patio was, and she said it was in the daycare part of the house. It was an easy decision. We go inside the parents' room, and it's pitch black. I ask her where's the phone. She says, I think we'll have to turn on a light. I really didn't want to do that, but we really had no choice. I didn't have a flashlight with me, and I didn't bring my cell phone either because I had limited minutes on it. It was a much simpler time. Amanda didn't even have her own cell phone until after this happened. She turned on the light and we started searching around the room for the phone. Not only though did these people not have any curtains on any window, but they did not even have closet doors. We see a golf club leaning against the wall by the bed. They probably had that instead of a baseball bat, which is what I had next to my bed at home. We figured, though, if we hit someone with it, it was at least going to leave a mark. She grabbed it up and we continued our search for the phone. Looking at the obvious places, we find a cordless phone stand, minus the actual phone. The alarm is still raging. We have a light on and the person who opened the patio door is bound to notice all of this. I'm thinking at this point. She asks, Should we use the locate phone buttons? I look at her and respond, Yeah, if you want that strange guy coming in here with it and asking us if we were looking for something. I was getting extremely mad and scared in this situation. Standing there, knowing that we have to now go to the kitchen, the house alarm suddenly stops. It gets country quiet. If you've ever lived in the country, you know exactly what I'm talking about. There wasn't another golf club for me to grab, so I made her go out first, flipping every light on and keeping the doors closed as we passed. We double-checked the security panel. It said the door was still open. Hit the call button. It still doesn't work. Double-checking the front door is locked. We started off for the kitchen. I told her we had to check the patio near the kitchen and I grab a big knife that wasn't even close to being sharp. We check the patio door near the kitchen, and it's locked. We turn on all the lights, grab the phone, and dial 911. The phone isn't a cordless phone. It's one of the old ones with a cord attached on a wall. My friend is on the phone with the dispatcher, telling her what's happened. When I hear a whistle coming from outside the kitchen window, the thing people don't think about, because I didn't in my thinking that safety was turning on the lights, is that while you have the reflection of the inside on the window, people on the outside have a clear view of you, 
unless you press your face right up against it. I hear the whistle again. It sounds like someone trying to get someone's attention kind of whistle. But I can't see anything when I look outside. I'm not pressing my face against that window to see if I'm the person they're whistling for. My friend is still talking to the dispatcher and is crying now, saying she doesn't know the address to the house. She hands me the phone. Hello? The dispatcher lady sounds annoyed and tells me she needs an address to send the police to. I ask that she trace the call and she says something like, You're house sitting and you don't even know where you're at? Scared, angry, and overwhelmed, I hand the phone back to Amanda and start looking for something with the address in the kitchen. I'm looking in the junk drawer, on the counter, on the refrigerator, fully keeping an eye down the hall that has the daycare rooms, knowing that on the other side of one of those doors is a patio door that was fully open. Amanda tells the lady that she doesn't pick up the mail because of their lockbox. A few seconds later, she removes the phone from her ear and stares at me with a blank face. I ask her if they're tracing the call, because I could not find anything with an address. Amanda says low. She said I hope the police find you in time and hung up on me. I was so scared and angry at the same time. We knew that there were people outside. We knew that the patio door to the daycare area was wide open. We didn't know what to do. We stood in the kitchen silent for what seemed like forever, but was probably only a minute. I picked up the phone and dialed 411. I told Amanda they would have the number to the police department. As calmly as I could, I explained what was happening to us. I included the 911 dispatcher and said we really needed the phone number for the town's police department. Then, we heard a huge metal bang outside the kitchen window by the patio door. It sounded like someone dropping something metal and heavy. Amanda started crying, and I couldn't hold my fear and started crying too. The operator said they were connecting us and would stay on the line with us after getting pissed at that 911 dispatcher on our behalf. A police officer answered the phone, and the 411 operator started explaining what was happening to the police. They were asked to disconnect once we had established a connection to the police department. The police asked a few questions, and we heard that whistling again outside. The floodlights all around the house turned on. I was too scared to look outside. We had never turned on the patio light, because we had to walk across the patio window to get to the switch. We told the policeman on the phone about the whistling, and he said there should be several officers showing up shortly, and to just stay on the phone. We were outside the city limits, and knew it might take a while. Having an officer on the phone, though, made me feel a lot better. I was still really scared, though. He told us the police had arrived and were coming up the drive. The police said to put down the phone and open the door, so I did. What I saw was a police pickup truck with spotlights flashing into the pastures that ran along both sides of the drive. Two officers, not just with handguns but with shotguns as well, walking slowly beside the truck as it came up the long drive. Four officers approached the house asking us our names. One went to the phone and said they were here and hung up. They ordered us to stay in the dining room and began searching the whole house. One by one they returned. The last one came back in through the patio door by the kitchen. He said he'd searched the barn and the horse had looked really spooked. He asked what other animals were in the barn as well. They told us they didn't find anyone and the daycare patio was not locked. There was, however, a broom handle in the track to prevent it from being open too far. I looked at the patio door that the officer entered in and saw there was not a broom handle in that one, then felt dumb because he'd just walked through it. They lectured Amanda about not knowing the address of the house she was supposed to be responsible for and some other stuff I don't remember. After finishing statements, they said they'd stick around and look more, and if we wanted to leave, we could. They could lock the bottom lock, but not activate the alarm, and we were cool with that. We were out of there so fast. We got into my car and went to her mom's. Mentally exhausted, we fell asleep, and I went to my office job the next morning. She said she really didn't want to go back to the house, but she had to feed the animals their breakfast. Her mom told her to take her sisters, and she did. That afternoon, she called me at work. 
she was really nervous and began telling me that when they went into the house, there were footprints and poop on the carpet. I said it was probably that cop that had checked the barn. She said she wasn't quite sure. She also said that when they went into the barn to feed and water the animals in the morning, someone had tied all the rabbits' legs together in their hutches. They had ten rabbits the kids used for 4-H. Amanda then continued to say that there was a note left there with the word lucky scribbled on the back of a pizza coupon she thought came from the refrigerator door because the flyer was now suddenly missing a coupon. It took a while for them to untie the rabbit's legs and Amanda asked her mom to find someone else from their church to finish the house sitting. She was not going to go back. She also told the officer what she came back to but no one was ever caught and the police never called either of us to update us either. I'd like to preface this by saying I was young and drunk for most of this, so my bad decision making, while it may be annoying, was not just out of pure ignorance or anything like that. I was 20 and female at an anime convention. My 21st birthday was coming up a month later, so my roommates decided to let me get shit-faced, as long as I stayed in the room or left with someone I trusted. I was staying with a large group of people in one of the nicer hotel rooms there. I had been to quite a lot of conventions over the years and never really had a bad experience outside of a few cosplay creepers and shitty people every now and then. The weekend went pretty normally, except I was drunk, and my group was throwing small parties. On the night of a particularly not-so-fun one, I decided to drunkenly leave the room and go roam about the main lobby. That was when I met Steven. I have no idea how old Steven was, but he was at least an adult, probably a bit older than me. We ran into each other at a manga table, and he mentioned how he loved the manga I was holding. I didn't really read them that much, but I just liked the artwork. I'm more of an anime Andy. I still listened to him gush about the story for a few moments, though, because he seemed nice enough. I didn't really say much to him outside of, mm-hmm, and yeah, that sounds really cool. I thanked him for all the info and walked away. After about an hour or so of roaming around, I decided it was about time to head back up to my room. Back in my room, I had taken two shots with my roomies and was laying on the couch when we got a knock on the door. The music and talking quieted down as it was customary to shush when someone knocked in case of con security coming to shut down our party. That's when my roommate answered the door and said, Veronica, she's here, come on in followed by silence, then my roommate calling my name and telling me, hey, someone's here for you. Now two things drunk me didn't think about were the fact that I'd never told Stephen my name. Our interaction lasted five minutes max, and I gave no other information to him. On top of that, my name is complicated and hard to pronounce. Maybe I assumed he just described me, and my roommate knew who he was talking about but I didn't give him my room number either. No, we were several floors up in the suites area. You'd have to take a different elevator to get to the room than you would to get to a standard hotel room. I definitely wasn't thinking that at the time, though. I walked over to the door to see Steven smiling there. He asked me to go for a walk with him, and I drunkenly said yes. I mean, he was just an awkward anime dude who wanted a friend to hang out with. What was the worst that could happen? We were walking and he was talking to me about how he was recently watching an anime where the protagonist wouldn't stop killing the girl he liked. I've since googled that anime plot and not been able to find one similar to what he was talking about outside of some extreme yandere stuff. I got a bit creeped out as the hall was completely empty now and we were walking with no plan of where we were going. He then began to talk about his favorite serial killers, how he was a huge crime junkie and followed a lot of cases. A big red flag went off in my head and I decided it was time to try and go back to my room. Then he suddenly stopped walking 
and stared right at me. I know a really cool spot we can go to. If you take the staff elevator, you can go all the way up to the top of the hotel. It's really pretty. He was suddenly breathing a little oddly, and his hands were shaking with excitement. I said no, as I still had some sense left in my drunk-ass head. He then grabbed my arm as hard as he could and started pulling me, yanking me toward the staff doors. I pulled back, asking him to stop. He told me to shut up and be quiet. I yanked free of him and started running. He chased after me, yelling at me to stop. I was nearly in tears and wondering why the hallways were so empty at one of the most crowded cons I had ever seen. When I finally ran into a group of girls, they saw the fear written on my face and immediately pulled me into the midst of their group, asking me about my hair and makeup, wrapping their arms around me protectively. I was crying, telling them what was happening, and when I looked back, Stephen was already gone. I didn't see him for the rest of the con, but I stopped being so friendly at cons because of him. I would also like to say that Stephen is just the name I gave him. I never learned his actual name personally. I told con security about him, and my roommates and friends used the buddy system with me for the rest of the convention. When I was about 10 or 11, I was very ill and did not go to school one day. My parents both worked and couldn't get the day off either, so they told me to just stay in the house and don't answer the door for anyone. The usual stranger danger talks and all that. I was just sitting watching TV in the front room that had a big bay window that looked out onto the street, which was a main road with a row of shops just across from it. I felt awkward with all of those people just walking past able to see right into my house, so I decided to shut the curtain slightly. For some reason though, as I started to do this, I noticed a man in his late 40s or early 50s with a beard and glasses, wearing a green knitted jumper. He almost looked like your stereotypical child abductor. Something about him walking past my house just seemed a bit strange but not enough to play on my mind. At least, until he walked past again, ten minutes later, in the same direction he had just come from, as if he had just looped around the block to come back around. Ten minutes later, he appeared again, and stopped at the edge of the driveway for about thirty seconds, looking into the window. He then proceeded to the door, peering inside as he walked by. It was an old Victorian sandstone house, with big storm doors on the front that you needed a key to open, so he couldn't get in. He knocked on the door a few times, but something just told me not to answer. He then came to the window, banging on it and saying something I couldn't quite make out through the glass. At that very moment, I noticed the realization in his face when he saw that there was a back door as well. My parents never locked that back door, so the dog could come in and out as he pleased throughout the day. I bolted through the kitchen, and within seconds of turning the key and locking it, the handle started jiggling violently, and he started banging on the door. I curled up in a ball on the floor in fear. He started trying to open all of the windows after that, and eventually left only about 30 minutes later. I dread to think what could have happened if I had not remembered that back door was unlocked in time. I'll be honest, I'm not 100% sure if this story is as scary as some of the other ones you've heard, seeing as I've never actually met this person, but I have nowhere else I know of that this could fit better. Since almost a year now, end of August 2019 to be exact, I've moved to an apartment in a different city because my mother who I lived with in my hometown passed away from cancer. I've moved here with my long-term boyfriend and one other roommate who's been a good friend to both of us since before we even started dating. We all absolutely love it here. The location is quite great. It's a 15-minute bike ride from my university 
and it's located at a square with a grocery store, drug store, lunch rooms, everything you could ever need right within walking distance. However, after just a month or two of living here, someone has started to ring my doorbell at exactly 11.05 p.m., semi-regularly, sometimes every day, sometimes every other day. Sometimes there's a week in between instances, and sometimes there'll be a couple of weeks in between. But it's always at 11.05 p.m. And every single time, I get no answer each time I ask through the intercom who it is. Except for once, but I'll get to that in a bit. At first, I thought it was friends from one of the neighbors who accidentally rang the wrong doorbell or something. But after the fourth time it happened, I began to grow suspicious. After more than those four times, I started noticing it would always happen either exactly at 11.05 p.m. or sometimes a few minutes earlier or later. My boyfriend and roommate both work at bars, so they both work until very late and would usually only get home at around 2 a.m. Each time this happened, I was always alone at home. It started to really freak me out after a while. When I first told them about it, they both kind of shrugged it off and said it was probably just a wrong dial. Just like I had thought too at first, but when I told them it had happened on so many different occasions, and sometimes even daily, they didn't really believe me. They thought I was just being a little paranoid and spooked. One night, however, when the doorbell rang again, I answered the intercom asking who it was. I could hear very heavy breathing on the other side. I was thoroughly spooked in that moment. I was again home alone and kept asking who they were and what they wanted. I couldn't make out from that breathing if it was a man or a woman, but I began to hear a strange mumbling and whispering as well. Then it was suddenly dead silent. They appeared to have left. I started putting my apartment door on double lock after that. I was so scared and spooked out. Thankfully, my roommate got home a little earlier that night, around 30 minutes after the doorbell rang, and he could tell immediately how upset I was. Now, with the coronavirus in full force, my roommate and boyfriend aren't able to work anymore, and they now also witness that frequent door ringing at 11.05pm. Now, they really do believe me, and agree it's very odd and creepy. We have a balcony that looks down at where our apartment building's main front door is, but because there's also a shop right underneath us that always has those curtain slash roof things out, the view to the door is partially obscured. Every time our doorbell rang, me, my boyfriend, and my roommate would go onto that balcony to see if we could see anyone, but we never could. They were always perfectly hidden. I've also asked my neighbors from my apartment building if their doorbell gets rang too, but all the ones I've asked have said that it has never happened to them. Two weeks ago, my roommate decided to do some investigating and went outside our apartment building at 11pm, standing across the street and pretending to have a smoke while keeping a close eye on the door. He said he did see a man who looked somewhat suspicious wandering around our building who slowed down his pace significantly as soon as he approached our door, but when he spotted that my roommate was glancing at him, he very quickly walked away. We aren't 100% sure if that's the door ringer, but it was very, very suspicious. Also, our doorbell hasn't been rung at night since that day. I'm hoping that maybe it will stop now, but there's a possibility it will continue again or even escalate in a few weeks. Sorry for the length of this, but it is a spooky enough experience for me to write it out. While I was deployed in Kosovo, my team did a lot of night missions that required us to cover a great deal of ground in a short period of time in order to make our extractions. All of this while remaining undetected by anyone in the areas we would pass through. We would always seem to see odd things during the night, but never anything like this. During one of our recon missions, we had started by getting dropped off in a remote location to identify whether shipments of mortar rounds and mines were being moved throughout the area. 
Our extract was going to be before daybreak, and we needed to make it just over 17 kilometers. The terrain wasn't too overgrown, and we had good intel over the area. It was either a full moon or very close to it. Of course it would be for a story like this. So unless we encountered somebody close by, this was going to be a pretty easy night. Our team was normally only four men, but we had the opportunity to make this a good training run for some of the new guys, so we took on an extra three people. We still wanted to make sure we played it safe though, so I took rear security, and we'll call him L, took the position just in front of me. We both worked pretty great together, and could easily manage to cover our team if needed. We moved about 10k through our starting mission area without finding anything, and had made good time doing it as well. At this point, we needed to start heading for the extraction point, which was located just over a good-sized hill and then through an area that was nearby a village, but not too close. We regrouped, did a count of people, ammo, and supplies, and moved out. Being rear security, I was the last to move, and just as I was about to take off, I heard a noise in the trees, maybe 50 meters away. I turned and saw L looking in that direction as well. He must have heard it too. Everyone else was still moving. Since the new guys were in the middle and were not used to looking back every 20 meters to spot your security, we were getting left. Chances were the noise was nothing more than a deer. But L and I started moving out, using a two-man bounding technique. We kept hearing this noise, so I told L to reach the team, while I remained in place after our next bound. I found a place with cover, and he bolted after the team. I heard the noise once again, and saw the trees move about 15 meters in front of me. Everything stopped. Two minutes went by with me being very quiet controlling my breathing and watching in front and to the sides. L and my team were slowly making their way to engage whatever had been following us. They came up on the sides and surrounded the area I signaled to. Once in position, I moved up. Nothing. Not footprints, tracks, or any sign something had been there. Cue the guys giving L and I a hard time for getting left alone and getting scared. All in good-hearted fun, of course. We move out again. Again, I am the last to move, with L between myself and the next man in front. This time, no noises when I step away. After about 2k, we come upon an orchard that we need to move through. The light through the moon was really bright and the trees were spaced, so we used them for cover as we stayed near the middle of the orchard. Just before I enter though, I heard the noise again. This time, I thought I heard a little girl giggling. Not something my imagination would just make up on its own. I was expecting to hear wildlife, if anything. This time, Al had already taken off an additional 20 meters and turned to wait for me. I moved to my location, and he moved out again. I was crouched next to a tree, watching for anything. All of a sudden, the tree I was next to caught my attention. In the knots of the tree, I swear I could see a face that looked like a person. As I squinted and looked more closely... A little girl's face appeared and she turned at me smiling, waving a little hand and giggled, then disappeared as soon as she had come. I was in absolute shock at this point. There was not a chance in hell I was going back to my team to report what I just saw, so instead I bolted and caught up to L and kept my mouth shut, recognizing I had likely just lost my mind. I was definitely not going to talk about this. We hit our extract in time and leave. Two weeks go by, and I'm told I'm needed to provide security for a team of combat engineers who are going through an area I'm familiar with. In the meantime, my team was going through the area we were in two weeks ago, where Elle and I got scared. Again, I never said a word to anyone about what I'd seen. In my mind, I was quite happy about not going back there. So, I go with the engineers and help them find a minefield that had been recently laid in an area that kids walk through every day, mind you. They take care of informing the village nearby to be careful, and they start blowing up the mines in place. I really appreciate those engineers and the hard work they did out there. I get back and am taken to see my commander and told thanks for the work. Feeling great, I head back to my barracks room, a place I rarely get to visit, and see that none of the other guys are back yet. No sooner than taking my boots off, the door opens. 
I hear everyone laughing as they enter, but L is not laughing, telling everyone to screw themselves. One of the other guys sees me and blurts out, Hey man, L says he isn't going on patrol with us anymore in your favorite spot. I just grimace and wait for stuff to calm down. A couple days later, L and I are out playing babysitter to some scouts. He says, What did you see that night? I shrug and say, I don't know, just my imagination getting the better of me, I guess. He then says something that sends chills up my spine. I know you saw her. I saw her too. Tell me I'm not crazy. You're not crazy. Where did you see her? He said. She was inside a tree. I had never given any information to Al about what I saw or details that could have led him to come up with the same conclusion. When I saw that girl in the tree, Elle was 40 meters away from my location and could not have even seen me looking at it. So last Friday, I, 25 and female, had a little time to kill before picking my kids up from school. It was a gorgeous day out, so I decided to spend some time cruising some back roads in my hometown, small and rural, listening to some music. I passed this guy with his thumb out, trying to catch a ride. I almost picked this guy up. He looked to be about late 30s, early 40s, carrying a fishing pole and a backpack. Pretty innocent looking, all things considered, I guess. But see, I'm a lone female, and have been taught by hundreds of hitchhiker gone wrong stories that you just keep driving. So I kept driving. As I was driving away, I'm having this internal dialogue of guilt about my decision not to pick up this guy. You know, if I was hitchhiking, I'd hope someone would pick me up and... I mean, really, what's the worst that could happen? That mixed with my new self-improvement goal of doing things that scare me as often as possible led me to the conclusion that if when I looped back around he was still walking, I would pick him up. Sure enough, about ten minutes later when I came back around, he was still there. I was feeling a little bit nervous pulling over and getting him, but what was I going to do? Peel out while he was trying to get in my vehicle? As soon as he hopped in, I realized I'd probably made a really horrible mistake though. One, because he seemed like he was tweaking balls and smelled god-awful. And two, because this dude was looking at me like I was a feast and he was starved. I didn't realize exactly how rattled I was with my decision until he asked me for a smoke. My hands were shaking so badly I could barely even pull one out of my pack without breaking it. Driving made it easier to hide my nerves, but I was internally freaking out and trying to decide how to beat this guy's ass if he tried anything. Turned out his name was Wayne, and he lived about five minutes from where I picked him up. Meanwhile, he's telling me how he lost his license due to DUIs, and he's living in his house with an old man. He tried to get him to come with him, but he didn't want to come, etc., He's also trying to sweet-talk me into hanging out at said house with him and come over and drink with him the next day. When I finally get him to his destination, it's a little shack-like thing, surrounded by all these junk cars and shit. He gets out and is trying to still get me to come inside with him. I firmly tell him no and leave. I was actually feeling really relieved and in fact a little bit proud that I just faced down a fear of mine just fine. Fast forward to Monday. My instructor says, Holy shit, apparently someone got murdered down so and such road. Do you know anyone down by that way? I say, Wow, you know, that's really ironic. I actually took a hitchhiker down that road on Friday. His name was uh, Wayne or something, I think. Probably wasn't even 15 minutes later when I see good old Wayne's picture on Facebook saying the TBI has picked him up for stabbing someone to death at the very house I dropped him off at Friday. Graphic information about how he stabbed him in the lungs and the victim had bled out in that little shack and the old man he was living with didn't even exist. I swear, I'll never pick up another hitchhiker for the rest of my life.
A little bit over a year ago, I had a job working overnight at a gas station, quite close by to my house. I'm a woman and was 31 at the time. I know, to some it seems unsafe for a woman to work graveyard shift by herself. However, it was a very slow store, and the sheriff's office was only about 20 feet across from it. I really didn't think I would have that many problems. And there would be about 30 customers in an 8 hour shift or so. And that was on a busier night. This night, it was about 3.30 in the morning. I went outside to sweep the parking lot and do a last minute check of the trash. It was about time for a cigarette. I had one headphone in, kinda jamming out. Across the road, in the parking lot of the sheriff's office, I saw a figure with his back to me. He was swaying back and forth while looking down. Honestly, it kinda looked like he was enjoying a much needed piss. Against the sheriff's office though? Yeah, the building closed at 4pm and didn't open again until 6 the next morning, but like, why? By the back of his ripped white t-shirt, I remembered that he had come in about 4 hours earlier. He had been a total creep and I could tell he already had a good buzz going. I didn't say anything. I just took my eyes off him and tried not to draw attention to myself. It was working until a car pulled in. I was still outside as they pulled up. I saw him look over to the car, then look at me, then back and forth again. As the customer was leaving, I walked her outside. I still had half a smoke burning and had left my dustpan outside with the squeegee. We both heard him start to swear angrily and seemingly begin to engage in an argument with himself. She looked across the road and told me to be careful. I made an awkward joke about him being the one who should be more afraid of me, or something like that. The man was still there, but now closer to the road, facing the parking lot of my store. Whatever he was yelling was completely unintelligible. He was obviously very drunk and could barely even stand straight, still swaying away. I didn't engage him, but I didn't take my eyes off him this time either. I just slowly backed into the store. Something about his face really bothered me. It had a darkness to it, but his eyes looked completely wild. My experience during graveyard jobs has been that the crazy-eyed ones are always the worst offenders. I didn't like it at all and wanted no part of it. I still had almost three hours to go and two before any other employees would arrive. I instantly went to the computer and typed up a temporarily closed sign just in case he wanted some trouble. I was coming around the counter on my way to the doors when I saw he'd walked across the road in the meantime and was now on my side now. I literally just barely got the second door locked when he stumbled into our very small parking lot. My hand mined the signal for cut across my neck, basically telling him, nope, sorry, can't come in here, we're closed. I shook my head back and forth too, hoping to further discourage him. He started walking away but screamed something at me while he was walking. I don't mean he was grumpy and shouted at me or yelled that I was an asshole or something like that. He was completely enraged and violently throwing hands at invisible enemies everywhere. Definitely knowing I was in the wrong shift of the wrong job, I got really skeeved out. I decided to call the cops. It's a good thing I did at that moment too, because the very minute I hung up with them, here he comes again up to the door. He starts pulling and banging on it. He backs up and runs into it, trying to slam it. Not that it would have done any good. I made the mistake of telling him I'd called the cops and his ass was about to be grass. I say I made the mistake of telling him, because once I said that he took off immediately. The police never found him. They drove across the road and around the surrounding neighborhoods for over an hour, but found no one. He was on foot, so I really don't know where he could have gone to in such a short time. He didn't harm me, and with them not finding him, I didn't fill out a police report or anything. I was safe behind thick glass doors that were locked for the rest of my shift. It just sucked, though. Maybe if I didn't warn him ahead of time, I wouldn't have had to spend the next three months of my job constantly looking over my shoulder for him. I'll never know what the right choice in that moment was. I'm just glad I made the right choice and don't work there anymore.
Just to preface this story, this happened about 12 years ago, when I was around 13 years old. The memories and emotions of this incident had faded away into the back of my mind, but recently I started having flashbacks of this event, and it led to multiple panic attacks while driving or in public. After some deliberation, I thought perhaps writing about it and sharing it with a community that might understand the fear of experiencing this sort of thing might help me feel validated with my emotions. So here goes nothing. I was a 13-year-old living abroad when this happened. To give a short background info that might help you understand the story a bit better, I was living in an apartment complex. Every morning, the school buses would arrive at the main entrance of the entire complex and pick up all the kids for school. The church I was attending at the time also operated buses to help people get back home, so every Sunday after the services were done, I would take the church bus back home. I never doubted my sense of security and safeness, since this kind of system made me feel very safe and protected. That was until I met him on one fateful Sunday morning. I was a church kid, quite the involved one too. I was serving the youth group as a part of the welcome team for newcomers when I first met him. He entered the chapel with his mother following behind, and she explained that they had recently moved to the country and were just starting to settle down. My first impression of him was that he was very lanky, shy, and very quiet. He seemed so harmless innocent, naive. So when his mother left him after filling out the form, I gave him a smile, greeted him, led him to an empty seat, and thought nothing more of him until I saw him again in my small group. So I greeted him again, saying something like, so nice to see you again. I still remember how he just shyly nodded, not really answering me. When the small group time ended, I took out a haichu, a Korean soft candy, and gave one to everyone in the group, even the teacher. As I handed that rectangular candy to him, he softly whispered, Thank you, and walked away. It was the first time I'd ever heard him speak. I hadn't realized that he was living in the same complex as me until I got off the church bus and saw him coming down the steps of the bus as well. It was quite the funny coincidence so I told him how weird it was that we were in the same small group and living in the same complex. He nodded again, and I walked off first, because he was waiting for his mom and little sister who were coming behind him. My apartment was number 20, the first in the row of buildings. I had opened the door and was about to go in, when he followed behind me. Me, still in that newcomer greeting mode, responded to this by asking him if he was living in the same apartment building as well. He nodded again. I noticed that his mother and sister were not here yet, so I got into the elevator first. I asked him if he was going to wait for them. I gave him my goodbye when he quietly nodded yes. Next morning, I saw him waiting in the lobby when I got out of the elevator. He was alone, and I asked him if he was waiting for his sister. He nodded, so I gave him a quick, Have a nice day! and ran off so I wouldn't miss my school bus. For every day of that week, I saw him waiting for his sister in the lobby, standing in the corner right in front of the elevators. I really didn't think very much of it. I would always say hi or good morning to him, and he would always just nod or wave back timidly. There was nothing more to it than that. That is, until one Sunday, when I got back home after church. He was walking along behind me, this time together with his sister and mom, so I thought I would be a nice girl and hold the door open for them. I waited, holding the door open, only to have all three of them walk right past my building. How strange, I thought. So I peeked my head out to see what building they were entering. Number 15, which was five buildings down the street. At first, I didn't think too much of it, thinking they might have just moved out of building 20 and into building 15 recently but when I stepped out of the elevator the very next morning to see him again in the lobby in the same corner he would stand in every morning, my heart sank deep. I don't know how I responded to it, but I remember choosing not to confront him because I was in denial that this was actually happening and didn't have the courage to ask him for an answer. Things very quickly progressed after that day. 
I started getting these late night calls on my cell phone. The typical not going to speak but just going to breathe heavily kind of call you get that makes you feel insecure even though you know you're safe in your room. He also stopped waiting for me in the lobby after that morning but would stand on the far corner of the street every day and watch me wait for and get on the bus. Me becoming hyper vigilant of this didn't help the situation either. I could always spot him watching me even though he would often try and hide behind a tree or the guard's cabin or something. It made me feel sick to my stomach, but I don't think I felt so threatened and cornered to the point that I wanted to seek adult help, at least yet. I was a very, very private teenager who was already keeping some traumatic experiences a secret from my parents, so naturally this felt like another secret I would have to keep so they wouldn't worry about me. At church, I kept up my bright facade but would distance myself as far as possible to avoid any sort of contact with him. I actively put this distance between him and me because whenever I decided to play by my facade and say hi to him, instead of returning my greetings, he would stare into my face, then drop his gaze to my private areas. The fact that it was summer and I was wearing shorts did not help at all whenever he stared at my thighs and between my legs. The shame the embarrassment, the feeling I was being dirtied by his very gaze, the anxiety and paranoia was getting too much for me. I started to skip the small group session and left right after the youth group ended so I would avoid getting home with him at the same time. On days that I did happen to attend small group, I just sat quietly, unwilling to speak a single word while he stared intensely at me the whole time. One day, while the teacher was leading the discussion, he suddenly burst into an angry yell, shouting, Why do you keep ignoring me when you clearly know I like you? Needless to say, I was embarrassed, ashamed, shocked, and terrified at the same time. The teacher tried to de-escalate the situation, but he stormed out after yelling about how frustrated he was with me for not returning his affections. I wanted to leave as well, but the fear that I might run into him made me stay in my seat while everyone in the group quietly whispered among themselves about this sudden drama that happened before them. It was actually a huge shock to me that he was doing all these things just because he liked me. But what shook me more in that moment was the fact that the teacher didn't seem phased at all by this sudden outburst. She also didn't seem surprised by the fact he had such feelings for me. Instead, she casted glances at me with this sort of knowing look in her eyes. I had always wondered how he got a hold of my phone number. This was it. The teacher dismissed everyone, but asked me to stay. I was always the model student at church, but the moment I was left alone with her, I lost it. I cursed and swore, and demanded her to tell me what she knew, if she knew how much he was making my life miserable. She told me she knew he liked me. Apparently, he started liking me because of that stupid-ass candy I gave him on the very first day. She had given him my number because she thought it was cute seeing him crush on me so much. So I told her everything he had been doing. How he waited for me every morning in the lobby, even though he lived in a different building. How he would stare at me and watch me from the corners of streets. How he would stare at my thighs and my chest, call me late at night with the heavy breathing and all. I was having trouble speaking and breathing because of how much I was crying, but I remember yelling, He's like a fucking stalker! And that's when I fully recognized that I was really being stalked. When I became quiet due to the shock of realization, the teacher took her chance to speak and told me he was a mentally troubled kid who didn't know better, so I needed to just bear with it. That was the end of the conversation. Honestly, there's a gap in my memory after that day, so it's hard for me to recall what events led up to it, but the last time I saw him was when I had the most fearful encounter with him. I was already on the church bus waiting. There were two girls sitting a couple of rows ahead of me, and the bus was silent other than that. I was sitting by the aisle when I saw him get onto the bus as well. The strange thing was that when he got on, the two girls suddenly turned extremely hostile toward him and told him to get the fuck off the bus calling him a pervert. He responded angrily, Well, you whores aren't the ones I wanted to see anyways, so shut up! 
That was the first time I'd heard him speak such profanities. Honestly, I was shocked. He then fixed his eyes straight at me, walked over to where I was, and sat a row diagonally behind my seat. My heart was pounding at this point. I wanted to sit by the windows to hide from his gaze, but I was scared that he would think of it as an invitation to sit next to me. I stayed frozen in my seat until more people came in, and only moved to the window seat when an adult asked if they could sit next to me. I think there was an instinctive feeling that told me I could not get off together with him off that bus, so I purposefully got off at the stop before my apartment. It was only a 600 meter walk from the bus stop to my home, so I mixed in with the people and got off the bus with them. The bus had stopped by the side entrance of another apartment complex. I just needed to walk down the street to get to mine, but this street was empty and deserted. It was one of those areas waiting to be developed by the city. I started walking towards my home, when I realized that he was now following behind me. He was walking just a few feet behind. My gut wrenched as he got closer and closer. Something told me that being alone with him on this street was dangerous, so I broke into a run until I saw an alleyway that parted off from the road. In my panic, I turned into the alley and was relieved when I saw that there were some smaller shops that were still busy with people. There were also people just hanging out in this alleyway, chilling by the benches outside and stuff. I was certain he couldn't have followed me into the alley after I'd run, but I still looked behind to check in case. There he was, still following me. He had sprinted after me. My relief quickly turned into terror, and I hastened my pace, purposefully weaving in between the people in hopes of losing him. But whenever I looked back, he was getting closer and closer. Eventually, the people hanging by the shops thinned out, and I was now walking in an empty alleyway. On the opposite side of the alley, I could see there was a bigger road with more cars and people. I was already quite out of breath, as I wasn't a fit person, but with the last of my strength, I ran for that busy road, hoping to lose him if he was still behind me. I stopped once I reached it, and turned around to look into an empty alley. I stood for an extra minute staring into it, to confirm he wasn't still following me. Fortunately, my friend's house was close by, so I stayed at her place until I felt it was safe enough to walk back home. That was the last time I saw him. I stopped going to the small groups. I started serving children's department as an accompanist so I could avoid going to the youth group altogether. I didn't see him again after that, but one time I happened to meet my small group teacher and she told me he had left the country. Apparently, he was reported multiple times at school for lewd behavior, such as sneaking into the girls' restroom, which was why the girls on the bus were so grossed out by him. In the end, he had to be expelled from the school. I think that was when I decided to bury the fear and terror away, because he was no longer an immediate threat on my life. Funny story, though. After the whole incident, I had to watch Ferris Bueller's day off at school, but the moment Ferris's friend Cameron Fry showed up on screen... I had to run to the bathroom and throw up because the actor's face looked exactly like him and just watching that face brought back all the trauma. Anyway, if anyone has made it to the end of this, thank you for staying through this with me. I often wonder at night what might have become of him and wonder if his parents knew what their son was. If he was truly suffering from mental illness, my only hope is that he received the proper treatment so no one else ever had to go through what I had to. I work at Jimmy John's and am training to be a PIC, person in charge. They're teaching me to run night shifts, along with closing the store. I was used to working in the daytime, around 11am to 2pm, and held off on taking up the position, since I knew the area was very sketchy at night. I wanted to move to a better apartment complex though, so that made me change my mind in the end. Normally, we have a male driver who stays after close, until I and my co-worker who's training me, Anna, leave. But tonight, he called out sick, and didn't have the chance to get his shift covered. Mind you, when the area manager, not Hannah, was talking to me about taking this position, he told me about the area being sketchy and how I'll always have a male to make sure I'm safe. 
He, however, claimed the most that would happen is being harassed by a homeless person or something. After I heard our male driver wasn't coming after all, I just had a gut feeling that something bad was going to happen tonight. After 9pm, our store gets maybe one or two customers before it closes at around 10. Usually, we lock the doors at this time, but this time we forgot. This comes into play later, but no, no one came in to bother us. The shift goes by as usual. We're running a little bit late since we're missing a coworker, but it was pretty much all good in the hood. We gather all our trash bags, boxes, a bucket with a lot of trash, and put them outside. We were planning on putting the bags and shit in our trunks to take to the dumpster a few stores away. I can't really describe this very well, but our store is part of three other stores in the same building. There's a little straight walkway, and as you go on it, you pass by the other storefronts. Ours is on the far end, furthest away from the dumpster. It's within walking distance, but again, the bags, boxes, and bucket were a lot to drag with us. When we place our stuff out there, we see a guy standing by a column in front of our store. I immediately got a bad feeling again and shook my head at Hannah. Hannah said something along the lines of, Hey! To which he mumbled, Hi! Or something back with an off-putting smile. He looked like he was on drugs, which wasn't that uncommon around here. Anna put her bags down outside the store and went to lock the door, then came out to lock the second door from the outside, now closer to me. We go to grab our trash, she puts hers in the trunk while I keep glancing over at this dude. He's now mumbling something to me. I can't even tell you what he said, maybe something like nice store or something? He tried to open the front door, but of course it was now locked. I mean, you just watched us lock it, you crackhead. What the fuck? I throw the trash into my back seat. Anna starts to pull away, when I gesture to her to stop since I felt uncomfortable being left alone with him, and my car's door was frozen shut. I open the front passenger's door and get in with my trash, lock the door quickly, and gesture to her that I'm okay. I crawl into the driver's seat and drive the short way to the dumpster trash thing. She's closer to the dump and puts her trash in. I grab the box, bag, and bucket out of my car and throw the bucket, keeping track of where the creeper dude is. I don't see him now, though. I grab the trash bag and box when I suddenly see him sprinting down the pathway in front of the stores while crouching. I panic. He's close enough to where he'd be next to me in less than 10 seconds. I shoved the boxes into my car door from the driver's side. I was able to crack it open from the inside when trying to get out of the car to throw the trash away. I kept pushing and shoving. Get this fucking trash into this fucking stupid car right now, you idiot. Hannah was already in her car at this point, and I finally got the trash far enough to where I could sit down. Frantically, I get in and lock my doors. Guess what? The dude is right next to my face outside my window. He's mouthing something, doing crazy shit with his hands. I freak out and put that bitch into drive and follow Hannah out behind the buildings. We get out onto the street and I'm still in shock and hadn't fully processed what just happened. I see Hannah pull off the road to the bank. She has to deposit the money we made in cash today. She calls me and I start to process it. We freak out a bit and call 911. I was shaky voiced and trying not to cry. I describe where my Jimmy John's was, what happened, what he looked like. Mind you, I'm still in shock a bit, so I told the dispatcher I wasn't fully sure. He's white, wearing a black hoodie with his hood on, dark pants I think, light eyes, maybe blue or green. I described all that happened and she sent the police to check it out. After the call, I felt hopeless. She had an awkward end to it and I didn't feel very reassured. I told her to have a good night after some awkward silence and she hung up on me. I have anxiety. It used to be a lot worse, but it was finally hitting me now. What was that guy's goal and what was he on? Did he have any weapons? I didn't see any, but if he got to me, would he have used them? Maybe he just wanted my car or something. But why would he crouch run to steal my car when I was less than 10 feet away from it? I finally get home and panic on the way in. I get in, hear my puppy barking and panic more. I cried and choked and tried to catch my breath for an hour. I had to pee, 
I had to shower, and I couldn't. I was feeling so overwhelmed. Anna texts and asks if I'm okay, says we'll talk to our manager, and so on. She didn't even know the guy had made it to my window. I told my brother who was at a house party what happened. He promises to come when I close to protect me from now on. He does jujitsu and practices self-defense a lot, but he stays at the party. Turns out our store doesn't have cameras. Fuck me. Why would our manager think it's okay to let Hannah and I close by ourselves? I was told we'd always have a guy with us. Of course, this shit happens the one time we didn't have one. I don't know what our manager can tell me to comfort me about this situation. I just hope she lets my brother stay in the restaurant to protect us. Otherwise, I'm not sure I can work here anymore. This happened a couple of weeks ago. I live in a major city. My street is a narrow one-way. Cars can parallel park on one side and the street can fit about 30 of them. I'm outside my door, which is right at the end of the street, smoking a cigarette before bed. I'm looking across the street, when to my right I notice something right out of the corner of my eye, behind one of the parked cars way down. It was just a small movement. I really didn't get a good look, so I kept on smoking, when after a couple of seconds I saw it once again. This time, it looked like someone had just ducked down behind the car. The street was well lit, but it was hard to see because there were maybe 25 or so cars, and the movement had been so fast. Just about three seconds from them, I see a head pop up from the car in front of the last one I just saw. It was very clearly a head. Then it ducked down again. Before I even knew it, it had popped up in front of that car and was still now. Whoever it was knew that I had just seen him. He ducked again. In a flash, he was popping his head up from the next car in front, getting closer to me now. He definitely knew I had seen him. He was moving really fast. Not like supernaturally fast or anything, but very quickly. Up until this point, I was curious, but now I was feeling a bit uneasy and afraid. I'm 5'11 and 185 pounds and do work out, but I can't even remember the last fight I've been in. It was so creepy. Now he was only six car lengths away, and I could see him clearly. He was staring at me. He looked fairly normal, bigger than me even, and had glasses on. He ducked down behind the cars again. I almost pissed myself. I sprinted into my house and closed the door, and looked out through the peephole. I could only see one car and half of another one. I could just imagine the guy ducking down and scurrying to the next one, popping up again. I was just about to stop looking, when he popped up right from behind the car parked in front of my house. He definitely could not see me. I had no lights on in the hallway outside or inside. He just stood there, though, staring straight at where I was. He looked like he was mad about something. He took his glasses off and wiped them, then stuck them in his pocket, I think. I couldn't see his lower half, but it looked like he was wearing a long coat. Somehow, it seemed like he was staring through the door directly at me. For a moment, it looked like he was going to walk, and I was hoping he was not going to come around the car and up to my front door. Then he ducked down out of sight once again. I was pretty freaked out at this point. I stood at that door until 3.25am, listening and looking for him. Then I tried to go to bed, and was awake, listening for a long while. First off, a disclaimer. I'm no longer active on OkCupid. This was 2015. I wasn't really actively looking, but I would pop on OkCupid every few weeks to see if anything interesting was in my inbox. Being female, I had a very active inbox. Sorry to all you guys out there. I noticed an email from an interesting, fairly local guy. Email was alright, asking about polyamory, which I don't mind talking about if the person is sincerely interested and respectful. We got to chatting. I had zero romantic or sexual interest, but I thought this could be an alright friendship. 
After a few months of chatting, he found me on the Book of Faces and asked if it was okay to send a friend request. I agreed. We had been chatting, getting along very well, and he seemed like a nice person. A little bit weird, but that's okay. I'm a little bit weird myself. No big deal. We continued to chat here and there for about two years or so, sending birthday greetings, just a very casual friendship. He had asked to meet several times and hang out. I'd considered it, but at the time, I was running my own business and working upward of 70 hours a week, plus maintaining my own home. I was also raising my younger child and trying to balance two partners and an extremely needing, demanding, workaholic client who had no boundaries. So, in the end, the meetup never occurred, but we did keep in touch online. Late last year, a news story broke about a man and his girlfriend raping and murdering her young teenage daughter. I never connected the name at first, until a friend contacted me. Oh, uh, I see you're friends with this guy. Did you hear the news? The news stories all use his full legal name, not his nickname. Which is why I had never connected the two before. It was him. My then online friend of two years had beaten, raped, strangled, and then dismembered his girlfriend's teen daughter, all with the girlfriend's help. He's made several statements since then, stating that he's always had this murder fantasy and that this child was very sexual. It wasn't fun murdering her as he apparently thought it would be. It still sends chills down my spine. I dodged a bullet big time. Be safe out there. You never know who is on the other end of that keyboard or phone call. A friend of mine and I were driving home from high school one afternoon when we came up to a red light at a main intersection. The left turn light turned green and my friend accelerated, maybe perhaps a bit too quickly as his tires peeled out a bit. Suddenly, the green pickup truck behind us speeds up next to us on our left. The driver was a scary looking bald man that was very clearly yelling at us even though the window was rolled up. Unfortunately, we got stuck at another red light. I alerted my friend as the truck driver pulled up right next to us again at the light. On the other side this time, the driver motions to us to roll down our window. We tried to decline as politely as possible. That's when he makes a gun with his hand and points it at us. He then points it at his head and pulls the trigger. He started making moves towards his glove box just as the light turned green. We both looked at each other with looks of terror. My friend guns it as we both scream. The truck peels out towards us clearly tailing us right on our ass. I decided the best thing to do was to try and lose him near my house in my neighborhood. I was familiar with the area, so if we got ahead of him enough, we could pull into a cul-de-sac before he spotted us. Sure enough, he was following us the entire time. As we pull into my neighborhood, I tell my friend to speed up quickly and pull a left into a subdivision. Thankfully, it worked. We speed down until we finally find a busy looking cul-de-sac and park behind a car on a driveway. We lay low and see the truck drive by multiple times by the street we chose to hide in. Huge sigh of relief. At that point we decided to just chill out and try to laugh it off. We don't know what could have happened. We ended up calling the police though and meeting up with an officer to make sure we could get home safe and sound. Never saw the fucker again after that either. I used to work as a cleaner at my school after class, so by the time I left, the roads were pretty quiet as everyone had already walked home. One day, as I was returning, I noticed a man walking behind me. Not too close, but very obviously following me. He was quite creepy. His face almost looked like it was completely made of plastic, and he had this really subtle smile. Anyway, the first time I saw him, I thought nothing of it. About two weeks later, though, I noticed him again. From then on, I saw him every single day when I was walking home. 
I didn't tell anyone because I was 16, and I knew my parents would want to start taking me to and from school. That just really wasn't cool. Anyway, one weekend I was walking to my friend's house, which was a similar route to the one I would take to school. As I was turning up the main road that he would follow me back to school from, I happened to look over at a minibus that was parked at the bottom of the road. I swear to God, he was sat there in the driver's seat, staring through the window at me. I called my friend and made it very obvious that I was on the phone, thinking it might deter him. But when I next turned around, he was only two meters behind me, with that same plasticky smile. I started to sort of walk and run. I could actually hear him picking up the pace behind me, keeping the same pace and distance the entire time. I was still on the phone to my friend. I told her to open her front door and wait for me. When I got to her house, I ran straight in and we locked the door right away. That man stood outside her house for about two hours, smiling and staring through her window. After that incident though, for some reason I never saw him again. I moved away since, but when I went back to visit my parents last weekend, that minibus was still there, parked in the exact same spot it had been all those years ago. When I was about 13 or 14, I lived on a farm in North Carolina. This wasn't a regular farm that you would expect with fields full of beans and shit. It was actually a pine tree harvestry. Pine needles are a big landscaping commodity, so we lived basically in the woods and would bale the pine straw every year. Whatever. The point is that my house was in the middle of 550 acres of perfectly lined longleaf pines. My living room had a huge picture window. I won't go into the full architecture of the house, but it was a weird custom job built by some dentist in the 30s or something. The window in the living room stretched nearly the entire length of the room, maybe around 50 feet or so. The house was built on a subtle hill, so the living room itself sat 5 or 6 feet off the ground. You had something of an angle to look out at a solid mile of pine trees, during the winter, it was unsettling, because you'd get just a bit of snow, enough to reflect the moonlight, so you could see all the dogs and animals running around at night. I'll be honest, I hated that room, and that window. Now on to the relevant part. I had a cousin over for the weekend, and we were doing what kids do in the country, throwing stuff into the fireplace to see what would happen. It was getting late, and the fire was dying down, though, so we built a big kingdom of couch cushions and blankets in the living room and got ready to head for bed. Nothing was out of the ordinary, until we heard the dogs start barking. They were really far away. The property stretches for nearly a mile, so I assume they were just off chasing whatever animal felt like shitting in our yard. My cousin is staring out the window though, not saying a single thing, which prompts the standard, what's wrong? He just kind of kept staring and said he felt like he was seeing things. Naturally, I started to get anxious and started staring out the window as well. Nothing happened for a few minutes. He got more and more annoyed with me because I was asking what he had saw exactly. He kept shushing me though so that he could focus a bit better. And then we both see it. The shadow of a person moves from one tree to the next. Not a run or a leap a brisk walk from one tree to another. This was only about 100 yards out from the house. We couldn't actually tell if the person was coming closer or not because we were dealing with moonlight reflecting off the snow and slush and ice. I guess the crazy part is that we didn't freak out that much because at this point there was still a chance that we didn't see what we had seen, you know. Maybe it was just the light playing tricks on us or something. So we kept on staring. I know we should have gone to wake up my dad, but he was kind of an idiot. He would be the guy to walk out on the patio and holler into the woods with his rifle. We were scared enough to agree that we didn't want to taunt with whatever was happening. About three minutes later, it happens again, but a good 50 feet or so from where we'd first seen it. Another person, another tree, a few strides. 
and then they were gone. This happened every few minutes for the next half hour, and we just stared the whole time. At this point, I should mention that we didn't really have neighbors. The land surrounding our farm was federal paper. I don't know who owns it now, so it was miles and miles of uncultivated trees. You would never see people around our farm unless they intended to be there. So, we kept watching these two figures, intermittently appearing and vanishing, until we saw one appear but never disappear. We focused on it and could see it was now sprinting forward. We lost our shit and went to wake up my dad. By the time we got into the room with my half-awake father, though, the figures were nowhere to be seen. We sprinted around, locking the doors and windows. Keep in mind that we're way out in the country with no one around. It rarely occurred to us to lock the doors. Every door was worse than the last, because you just know as soon as you reach the door, someone is going to be trying to force it open. But that never happened. We locked everything up just fine, and walked around the house at least 50 times, making sure no one got in without us knowing. We then convinced my dad to fall asleep in the living room with us while we stared out that window. I never understood why my dad wouldn't call the police. He always had this, we take care of our own mentality, and it simply wasn't an option for him to call 911. The next day, we went out to look, and absolutely, there were footprints everywhere in the snow. We saw them between the trees, and then we finally saw where someone had been standing right in front of the window. As I said though, I wouldn't have seen them, because while I'm seven feet up in the living room, they would have been right beneath me. My grandfather's company does timber and mining and was setting up an office in a relatively remote part of a third world country and found a house that was dirt cheap, even for third world country standards. Obviously though, there was a catch. The villagers from around the area told him not to purchase it, since the house was apparently haunted and everyone who had ever lived there had died violently. He decided it was just some superstitious BS and got it anyway. So... The guy setting up the office will live on the top floor of the house with his family and the lower floors for the office. He moved in with his wife and three kids. Anyway, my grandfather suddenly heard no news from him for the longest time. Since this was a remote part of a third world country though, he wasn't too worried since he assumed they'd just lost power or something. He finally contacted the local police after a while though to go and check on the guy since he was completely unreachable. They found everyone dead. Apparently, the guy killed his wife, kids, and then himself with a machete. Yes, not a gun, with a fucking machete. He actually hacked himself to death. It wasn't one of those cuts on the wrist to let everyone slowly bleed to death either. Everyone was hacked down, including the guy himself. The description of the scene had to be an exaggeration since I'm assuming the sight of five decapitated bodies, including three kids, were scary enough to make people see things. I won't bother putting it here, since I'm not sure what's true. There were details that people could not have possibly witnessed. Let's just say I stopped paying attention after I heard the phrase, magic machete. I was told the entire room was covered in blood, including the ceiling. Some people were saying the blood on the ceiling had to have gotten there because the spirits threw the bodies around or something. I had to explain a lot about blood pressure and got a ton of weird looks in return. Now, the weird part, if this isn't weird enough, was he had managed to barricade the door with the bed with his wife and kids on it. It was one of those old, gigantic beds that was extremely hard to move, too. The locals say this is evidence he was possessed by spirits. I say, moving to the middle of nowhere in some third world country, drove the guy nuts or something, and crazy people can do all sorts of crazy shit, and even perform crazy feats of strength. Anyway, my father had to pay a few bribes to make sure nothing got to the press, not very hard in the middle of nowhere, about the entire thing, and get the police to classify the deaths as natural. I have no idea how they explained that. Third world countries are awesome, aren't they? All the employees in the know had to sign an NDA, too. 
He tried getting other volunteers to set up the office, even if they hadn't heard all the gory details. Because of my grandfather's gag order, everyone knew the previous guy had died, so no one volunteered. He promoted one guy, gave him a fancy title, and told him he was now in charge of setting up that office. The guy quit not long after. There are some wonderful things about being young, poor, and in love. Sadly, this is about none of those things. When I was 22, I decided to move in with my equally poor boyfriend. Unfortunately, poor plus poor still equals mostly poor, but not so destitute that we couldn't afford an apartment in a college town. We happily moved into our little one-bedroom first-floor apartment. Sure, it had its problems, the lead-based paint was so thick we were sure we could survive a nuclear attack. The bathroom didn't have a vent. Instead, it had a window in the shower. The appliances were also from the time of my grandmother. But it was home. Our home. And we loved it. My boyfriend worked the graveyard shift and I worked days, so we spent a lot of time apart. That meant that when we were together, we enjoyed the simple things in life. A lot of naked time. Over time, when I was waking up and taking my morning shower, my boyfriend, who was just getting home, realized that he could come up to our open shower window and sneak a peek. I always caught him, though. He was in good fun, and we always had a big laugh. Eventually, I started to notice there was a log standing upright outside that window. I continually asked him why he would even need that. He was tall enough already. He'd claim it wasn't his, though, and move it away when I went outside to show him. Yet every few days, it would move right back. The guys who cared for the yard were there several times a week, so they must have just been moving it back out of the way against the building. Finally, before the snow fell, the yard workers cleared away all the yard debris, and we went on in peaceful oblivion, candy-coated, love-filled oblivion. Time went on, and our lease was up, but there was a great special at our cheap apartment complex. We could now rent two bedrooms, even cheaper than our one. We happily signed the new lease. The only problem was that our one-bedroom apartment was on a nice suburban street facing houses, so we never really noticed how bad our neighborhood was. We were moved to the other end of the community, behind an abandoned strip mall. Our front yard consisted of a dark alley, and some dumpsters behind a recently vacated Chinese buffet where a lot of stray cats seemed to live. None of this mattered in our dimly lit front yard, though. Our apartment was super cheap and super huge. What more could we ask for? That year, we were so happy that my boyfriend went to buy me a ring on Valentine's Day. Being young and giddy and in love, he wasn't able to keep the secret. I told him yes before he could even ask the question. He didn't have a lot of money, so he bought a ring with the help of a friend's father who owned a jewelry store. He got a good price, but with the drop in price, so comes a drop in attention to detail. I was devastated when he brought home the ring along with our wedding band set only to find out that someone had mistaken my very tiny 4 ring size with a 12. My rings were made for monster hands. What a terrible way to start our engagement. Clearly, they needed to go back so he put them in his glove box. But then, a storm prevented him from taking them back that day. The next day, he went to his car to find it had been broken into. Nothing had been taken, except the rings from the glove box. We never did have the money to replace them. We personally went to every pawn shop in the area, and everybody said they hadn't seen anything. I began to be jealous any time I'd see a woman with large fingers wearing a silver ring with Celtic knotwork. I kept telling myself that her deadbeat boyfriend stole my ring to give to that whore or something. Winter passed and summer came. With the summer came the warm breezes and fresh air through our open windows. What the summer didn't bring though was more money. Not for us and not for the city. We lost our cell phone service for non-payment. But it didn't matter. The only people we talked to were each other anyway. Meanwhile, the city cut police and even closed a few stations most of them in our neighborhood. It didn't matter, though. 
Summer days are long, and our dingy little corner of the community wasn't all that intimidating in the daylight. One night, my husband-to-be turned in early for the night, so I decided that after a long day, what I really needed was a nice soak in the bath. I walked into the bathroom and began to run the water, adding my bath salts and bubble bath. I opened the window for that nice summer breeze and took off my clothes and dumped them in a pile by the open bathroom door. I then grabbed my laptop to sit on the closed toilet seat so I could relax in the tub with a movie. This would be at least two hours of pure bliss. Nothing beats a long soak in my book. I turned the volume up on my laptop and relaxed the hours away with one movie after another. What must have been four hours later, I pulled the plug on the drain and sat while the water swirled away. I slowly stood up and stretched and dried off, the now cool night air hitting my face through the window. I figured I'd just leave that open though. The apartment could use some airing out. I stepped out of the tub and across the bathroom. I didn't bother to move my pile of clothes, instead stepping around them in a manner to get out of the partially open bathroom door. This move put me looking back into the bathroom, right out the window, where I could see a tall man. At first I was startled, but I quickly realized it must just be my fiancé playing a trick on me, like he used to do at our old apartment. Then I saw his eyes though, two up high in the window, and everything in my head began to swim. I couldn't scream, I couldn't move, I could only stand there naked and stare. Then everything came into startling detail. The man was standing up on something so high up, I could see his full torso in the window, his full torso and his privates. There was a man outside my window jerking off. The motion drew my attention to his hand. Everything happened in a split second after I saw him, while I was frozen on the spot. I noticed he was wearing a silver ring with a Celtic knotwork on it. I made a mental note of ways to identify him as I unfroze and ran to the bedroom. There's a man outside the window! I said so fast my fiancé couldn't understand as he woke up. What? he asked. There's a man outside the bathroom window. He's jerking off. He was watching me. Oh my god, make him go away! I was finally in hysterics as everything sunk in. That man could have been there hovering over me for hours, the only thing separating us being a thin screen. When I had stood up, he was inches away from my face, his body towering over me. I just kept covering myself with blankets and telling my fiancé to make him go away. By the time my fiancé fully woke up and went to check out the situation, nobody was anywhere around. There was only a log standing upright like a step outside our bathroom window. In the aftermath, we filed a police report, but had no phones to call, so had to drive a good 20 minutes away to do so. They didn't have enough forces to do anything about the situation anyway. We also didn't have enough money to break our lease. Instead, we spent the rest of the year living in fear. I covered every window with black contact paper. I wedged boards into every window too so they couldn't be opened. That bathroom window was never again opened. I never left without pepper spray. I never left after dark. But for the rest of that year, most nights, I'd hear a faint noise outside our bedroom window, which was right next to our bathroom. In the morning, when my fiancé would go check it out, there would be imprints in the ground, as if someone had just recently been standing there. I wish I could say it's just a story. I wish I could say that. But it's all the truth of three long years of my life and I still can't sleep at night. I may be a little bit too late to this, but I'll never forget this one. I was probably in the seventh grade, and was staying at my best friend's house. He lived in a rural area, right outside of a small town. We decided that tonight would be a cool night to go out and wrap some houses, because 7th graders are kind of dicks as I'm sure you know. We asked his parents if it was cool for us to go out that night. His dad told us no. He wanted us to stay inside and we were not allowed to leave. Well, my friend doesn't take no for an answer, so we snuck out at about 1am. His house sits on top of a hill with a long gravel driveway that connects to the road. We made it down with a giant black trash bag of toilet paper. 
Just as soon as we hit the pavement, my buddy said he heard a car coming and we should get off the road. We jumped down into the ditch along the side of the road and lay flat in the grass. Sure enough, a little while later a car speeds by. We give it a few seconds, then jump up to head on our way. That's when my friend goes, Shit man, it's coming back. I didn't know what he meant until I looked up. Way down the road, I could see the brake lights and the car turning around right in the middle of the road. We dove down flat again, wondering what the hell was going on. We were both in dark clothes, and it was pitch black out too. It's not like we stuck out like sore thumbs. The car comes by again slowly, but it's on the opposite side of the road this time. It drives past and we wait. My friend puts his hand on me to keep me down and looks up out the ditch. Dude, it's driving by again. By this time, we were both nervous as shit. It was obviously not a cop car. Dark color with no markings of any kind. What if it was not just some concerned citizen? There's a culvert in the ditch close by. I start to army crawl towards it. My friend tells me to be still. The car slowly rolls by and stops, just over the top of us. It drives off. It circles back. It drives by slowly. It stops. It repeats this over and over again. After the last time, we saw it go a little ways down the road. We jumped up, ditched the toilet paper, and sprinted up to his house. We locked all the doors, set the alarms, and watched. I remember when I looked out the window, I could see the car idling out by the end of his driveway. Holy shit, was that terrifying. We spent the rest of the night sitting in his living room with plastic bats and hockey sticks, waiting to defend ourselves. I get that it could have literally been anything, but tell that to 7th grade me. When I was 17 or 18, we lived in a little village called Shipton Bellinger in Hampshire, England. There's two towns fairly close that form almost an oval. I've always had trouble sleeping and was getting really into fitness then, so I started going out fairly regularly at 12 or 1 a.m. in the morning and running taking that oval route. It was a couple of miles of a run and it tired me out quite nicely. One night I'm coming to the end of the circuit. I'd gone via Tidworth and back up towards Lugershall. I know some of you are Google mapping this. There's a secondary school called Castle Down which is near a back road which leads towards my village again, totally unlit with trees on either side and then big open fields. So I'm under a street lamp outside the school, tightening my laces, when I hear a ton of noise coming from the woods. At first I figured it was just a deer or something, so I finish tying up and start to jog down the road. The noises start getting louder and louder though. It gets to the point where something is audibly coming towards me through the woods and I hear the metal fence shake as something starts to climb it. I took off so fucking fast down the road, full on sprinting the entire mile or so. I was constantly repeating to myself, if it can catch me it deserves me and don't waste time looking. You know it's there, just run. It freaked me the fuck out. I got into the village and stopped. I had to look for about a minute to see if anything would come out from the darkness. Then I pegged it to my row and house. I still don't know if it was a person or an animal or what. And frankly, I'm glad I never got to find out. When I was 17, my mom and I argued quite a bit. I always found her to be irrational, and had a hard time choosing to be the adult as often as I had to. One day, I was upstairs in my room playing a multiplayer FPS on my PC, when my mom hollered up the stairs to me that I needed to take out the trash because it was going to get picked up the next morning. I had explained to her before all about how you can't pause online gaming, so all I did was holler back, Okay, in a minute. There were no warning signs. I had no idea she was upset at all until she was already upstairs and in my room, 
screaming about me not getting up and doing it right away. She thrashed my room in a matter of seconds, breaking everything, including my monitor and a glass star-shaped candle my great-grandma had left me when she passed away. I usually tried to be an adult. Sometimes I argued with her. This time, all I really did was say something along the lines of, I'd rather be dead than live with you. This was meant to imply I was going to be moving out soon. Apparently, she took it as me threatening to take my own life. She called the police and talked to them alone. I talked to them alone, too. I made them look at my room, and my mom didn't have anything crazier to tell them that I had done than the actual truth, which was not taking out the garbage quick enough. They confided in me that they believed me, and they agreed that my mom sounded kind of crazy. But they pointed out to me that I was only a minor, and my choices were to live there and follow all of her rules or be put in some sort of home. They said that due to the nature of the call, they needed to take me to mental health, regardless of whether or not I wanted to continue to live with her. On the way there, they assured me that they could tell I wasn't a threat to myself, and that I would just have to sit down with a the therapist for a few minutes and I could be on my way. In the waiting room, it was just me and one other person, a girl who was high on meth and had been in some sort of domestic dispute. She kept talking to me, and she had the wildest look in her eyes. I've seen a lot, and I'm not easily scared, but she was somehow intimidating without even trying to be. The worst part was the way she kept going into the bathroom and coming out with blood all over her hands. She would walk away from me seeming just her normal crazy self, but exit the bathroom with her bloody hands in the air, a hysterical mess. She would cry and scream, saying things that didn't make sense at all. The first couple of times, the nurses thought she had been cutting herself, and kept demanding that she tell them what was the source of the blood. The last couple of times she did it though, they didn't ask her where the blood was from at all. I was still curious, but I didn't want to ask either. It made no sense to me that the staff could just get used to this. It wasn't a big deal when she would go back to the bathroom and come out with blood all over her, her body trembling and her eyes wide, her face covered in tears. Finally, they called me to go see the therapist. She was really nice and understanding. After talking to me for a few minutes, she told me that she dealt with people like me all the time, and I wasn't one of the ones she needed to worry about. I would be being released as soon as I left the room. She let me use her phone in her office to call a friend who would come pick me up. While I was on the phone with him, I told him he needed to hurry up and get there and get me the hell out of here, briefly mentioning the girl with the repetitively bloody hands. It was the disgusted yet sympathetic look that came over the therapist's face as I sent this that finally clued me in as to what the blood must have been. All of a sudden, it clicked in my mind and I knew there was only one way a female could keep having blood all over herself and yet show no wounds. The image of her bloody hands only two feet away from my face flashed in my mind, and I suddenly felt embarrassed and didn't know what to say. All the relevant information had been relayed, so I hung up on my friend and left the therapist's office without saying anything else. Luckily, the girl wasn't in the waiting room anymore as I passed, though, nodding at the receptionist at the front desk. I can honestly say that when I left the building that day, I was happy to be going home to my irrational mother. She no longer seemed so bad now that I had something to compare her to. From time to time, I think of that girl and imagine her out there somewhere in the world. I wonder what kind of stuff she had been through and what kind of stuff she's up to now. Whenever I hear somebody call someone else crazy, I quietly think to myself that they likely haven't seen anything like what I saw that day. I seriously hope I never get to her level.